the world, we just sort of broke it up into the so-called democratic West and the so-called communist East. The Soviets wanted to rule the world according to their ideology, and we in the West wanted to rule the world according to our ideology. And they were always trying to kind of get these countries that were aligned with us to align with them. And we were trying to get the countries that were aligned with them to align with us because it's really about power. All these countries started moving to the West. So the countries that were formally connected to the USSR, like Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Slovakia, Czech Republic, Romania, Bulgaria, they start aligning with the West. The Soviet Union, which is now just really becomes Russia, becomes really weakened. And so Russia has the idea that this is Ukraine right here, one of the key states. Well, at least we're going to hang on to this one. Russia took the next step and said, no, we're actually going to invade now. And now there's a battle for Ukraine and the Ukrainians are responding. And, it, and it's a serious war and it's very serious because Russia has a lot of nuclear weapons. And the West has a lot of nuclear weapons and there's a lot at stake. OK, so the first person we're going to talk to is somebody in Russia. And you can unmute, by the way, this is Sasha. My name is Nestor and I am a chemistry major and I moved here from Ukraine around nine years ago and I started living here. Bring, can we bring Taras in? Okay, tell him welcome to Soch 119. This is uh, Camilla. Is I've been working with Camilla for I don't know maybe eight years. I think we met met, met uh, seven or eight years ago. But I circled her shoes because she's always wearing cool sneaks, um, and she works at the at the War Studies uh, University in in Warsaw. Ask him. Here's my first question: What is he fighting for? In his words, right? За що Україна б'ється саме на головніше? І говоріть по пару речень, щоб я міг перекласти небагато нові. Ну, по-перше, війна почалася, Росія почала війну в 2014 році, захопивши Крим і частину Донецької та Луганської області. First of all, uh, the war began in 2014, and uh, Russia wanted to, uh, took over parts of the Donetsk and Luhansk region. So last year the war became uh, began fully in February 24th, 2022 last year and uh, the main goal which we already mentioned he, he said that they want to bring Ukraine back to the old Soviet standards of their beliefs that they mm -hmm. had before. Uh, uh, so the main um, part of Ukrainians fighting back is uh, for the freedom of Ukrainians and take back all the tether, uh, take back all the tether, tether, tether territory yeah. that they took over in 2014. They want it back and also fighting so civilians don't have to worry about uh, anything else and being free. Mm -hmm. Ми боремося за свою незалежність, щоб бути незалежні від Росії і вести розвиток свої розвиток країни так демократичним шляхом, а не таким шляхом, як хоче Росія. 
And also, uh, they're fighting for the independence from Russia, so Ukraine could pursue their own path away and uh, not being controlled by any of the Russians uh, continue to develop as a country, as a democratic country. Mm -hmm. Tell him I have it. Okay, no, go ahead. Go ahead. He said he personally lived during USSR and he noticed that not just him, but everyone around in Ukraine did not want to live in terms of the Russian ruling that they want to impose right now. So they, the, he wants to be aligned with the West. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, so I have a question. Tell him I have a question for him. So I, the title of this class is The People's War. Okay. And tell him that. Because so many Ukrainian citizens are fighting in the war. Yeah. So many civilians are volunteering and people are risking their lives in order to, to defend Ukraine. Багато людей своє життя ставлять на лінію, щоб захистити Україну. So how is that for him? As how what how is that? How does he feel about that? Як ви думаєте про це, що українці своє життя ставлять на лінію, щоб захистити Україну? Я думаю, що ми всі це розуміємо, що це є війна на знищення українського народу. І в нас інакшого шансу, як тільки стояти до кінця, немає. Я ці все прекрасно розумію. І тому, в тому числі і я, весь український народ це прекрасно розуміє. Ми будемо стояти до кінця, поки не буде звільнена вся територія України. Oh, he said that um, Ukrainians are um, going to fight till the end because the main, they don't have a choice. If they don't fight back, fight back Ukrainian culture, everything will go away. So um, even it is hard for him to see everyone go on the front lines, uh, but we will keep going till the end, till the war's over. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there... Okay, another question. No petanya was petai. So, when it seems that it is rare in the world, in my understanding of history of the world, to see civilians fighting against soldiers. Yeah. So, like this is a war being fought by Ukraine by all Ukrainians. Yeah. So. Okay, so the question is, so who supports Russia in Ukraine? Ukraine. <laughs> Вони побачили, як російська армія воює з дітьми, з жінками, як вони б'ють. Вони побачили Мариуполь, побачили Бучу. І багатьох людей, які симпатизували на Сході Росії, думка змінилася в протилежну сторону. Це ми бачимо по переселенцям, які приїхали до Львова. Він сказав, що більшість українців, які робили uh, support Russia before the war. Um, after noticing the horrendous things that they do to children, torture, there's much more. Uh, most of those people started 
the like not support Russia T turning against the, Russia yeah uh-huh because they saw the horrendous things they doing destroying yeah. everything yeah mm -hmm. so here's my next question then um, many most people do not experience war directly okay it's, you can say that Багато людей не, um, не живуть під час війни. And, and very few of my students have ever experienced war directly. Мало моїх студентів жили під час війни теж. Can you say a few words about what war is really like to live through? Можете сказати пару слів, як жити під час війни для вас, як, як вам чашку? Ну, в даний момент це був, скажімо так, це був перший тиждень, це була така паніка, думаю, ну, це як було, виглядало, як в кіно показують про початок якогось, як про початок війни. Тобто це були черги в магазинах за хлібом, ну, скажімо так, so whenever the war started, it was a huge shock for Ukrainians because it just looked like a movie. It's something you would see in a movie. And a lot of people started panicking. There would be huge lines of trying to get food. And the first few weeks was, were the hardest trying to adjust your and work any second. A missile could fly and hit your building, kill your family, friends. No, не вірили в це, що ця війна перейде повномасштабну війну. People, especially him, he did not believe it would be a full-on war that would occur. Я розумів, по крайній мірі, що Росія дуже багато зброї, дуже багато зброї, тому що зброя, яка лишилася після Радянського Союзу, хоч вона не є дуже ефективна, але її дуже багато. І знаючи, як воює Росія, це було страшно. У нас знищує всі міста і знищує, ну, правильно сказати, Веде, веде не точно війну, веде війну з е, жінками, веде війну з мирними жителями. І це просто війна, що вам йде на знищення, це дуже прекрасно розумів. Можете повторити а, про зброю, я не знаю, як перекласти її. Ну ж про зброю, що Великий запас зброї, який залишився в Росії ще у спадок від Радянського Союзу. Ні, в Росії. В Росії величезна кількість зброї. USSR have a huge stock of weapons that they have. A huge stock of weapons that left over in Russia, and they have a lot of ammunition to fight against Ukraine. And Ukrainians at first did not have much ammunition to fight back, thankfully, because of uh, nations around the world starting to provide weapons to defend themselves. They're able to slowly fight back. <laughs> побачили, що е, Захід, За, Західна Європа, потім е, ви, Сполучені Штати Америки, висунули підтримку українському народу, за що ми вам дуже вдячні, вдячні е, американському народу, вдячні вашому президенту Джо Байдену. І наш народ... Е, Це вселило якусь таку надію, що ми не одні, і в нас появилася віра і надія, що ми вистоїмо ці нелегкі відні.
He said that, um, of course, the first couple of weeks of the war, it was a shock for Ukrainians, but after seeing that U.S. and a lot of countries in the West started providing weapons, they gave uh, hope to Ukrainians and, um, and have the ability to fight back. And he also want to thank all the Americans and anyone that helping out Ukraine fight this brutal wall, war. Yeah. Hey, um, Taras, uh, yeah, thank you um, for joining us today. Yeah. Uh, when is with we're gonna win the war. Yeah. Yeah, I think to yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah thank you. Hey, welcome. Brilliant. Welcome. Yeah, welcome. How are you doing, by the way? Let's just start with you. Oh, boy. <laughs> what to start with? I mean, it has been a year, you know. Uh, a year ago, actually, I was in your class, and it was only a month after, on uh, February 24th, my husband just woke me up because... Um, yeah, you know, I'm Polish and uh, my husband is Ukrainian. He's in the Ukrainian army and he has been living in Poland for two years. Uh, he was released from the military and on February 24th, he woke me up and he said, it started, I'm going. So yeah, as a, just like, you know, out of many things, I'm also a military wife. So to me, it was obvious bring souvenirs yeah. Uh, and yeah so and to me like you know looking at this conflict I'm in the middle I'm somewhere between Taras and the folks that are uh, fighting that they're in, that are in the field and between my family that is actually still living there like you know my husband's daughter with a small uh, uh, with a small child is staying there although she could immigrate and i'm looking at it this conflict also uh from a point of view of um somebody who's taking care of the family while the guys are doing their job and yeah, let, let me let me ask you about that first off is he is he is he in ukraine right now yes of course has he been back at all since the war started uh, only once, but only because there was this, like, you know, uh, one of the official, um, one of the, um, uh, yeah, something happened in Poland related to the war, and he was actually sent here officially. So we've seen each other briefly, but there is no chance otherwise, simply because the guys aren't let out and they're needed there. And, the, and how? What do you tell? What do you tell your your children? Like, what do you tell them about the war? Right? Wait. How old are they? Uh, five, nine, and eighteen. What do, you, what do you tell them? What do you tell the five-year-old about where you where? Yeah, where your husband is. Like, what do you say? Like, how do you deal with that as a mom? Oh boy, um, with, you know, uh, with my youngest daughter, it's most heartbreaking because she is asking every day for this year and, uh, um, and uh, a month. She has been asking every day, where is daddy? When is he coming back? And luckily we are in touch. So she knows she can talk to him and it's great, but it's constant in our household that she always asks where he is and it breaks my heart. So, uh, but yeah, we're always just, you know, she knows that it's difficult, that there are children there that are suffering, that there are many people there that are suffering. And dad went there simply to help them. Uh, he's fighting for them. And once he's done with the job, he's going to come back home. And it seems to, you know, um, it seems to be working for now, although it is difficult. And, you know, 
Uh, my oldest, my older daughter, uh, at the beginning of the war, we had um, some family of my husband coming over and they were running away and they were in um, and they had a daughter uh, at the age of my my daughter. And, you know, they've been they came here in a really terrible condition. And uh, the girls were talking about what the girl uh, from the Ukraine saw there. And my daughter was, she was crushed. She couldn't eat or sleep. And she kept on asking me, mom, uh, how is that possible that things like this happen? And they happen so close and they happen now, you know, how uh, she, before the war, she didn't know what people are capable of. So this yeah, we're on it, and we also uh, consulted a psychologist on how best to talk to the children of war, and she said that it's best to be open, honest, calm, and composed about it, but still just, you know, keep your hand on the pulse, because it's well, difficult. Yeah, yeah, I really felt that. I, I felt for when you said something right there. I just felt the tears immediately in my eyes. Um, you know, you... Let me, I'm going to st stay with your children for a moment. Sure. They, they can't get away from it, right? I mean, the images are there, mm -hmm. right? They're in the media. People are talking Constantly. about it because this is Poland. This isn't like, you know, the United States or Co South Korea or something. This is Poland. You're right next door. You have so many Ukrainian refugees. Like you, the stories, the images are, are there constantly, right? So I, I really, I feel that. Um, tell me, so one of the things that is really difficult for us to understand, so Poland is right next to Ukraine. And so probably you've received more refugees from Ukraine than any other, any other country, right? Yeah. Think about that, like how is that? Like to have, I think it's like, there, there's something like, I have some numbers up on the screen, like over 8 million mm. refugees from Poland. In a huge, I mean, from Ukraine, and a huge Ukraine. number of those are. What's that? Could you just say something like sociologically about that? Of course. Uh, yeah, honestly, you know, um, before the war, I mean, before the war, even before 2013, when the whole war started, exactly as Tara said, uh, because it's nothing new, you know, it's very media right now, but it started in 2013. Uh, so we had, even before 2014, we had a lot of Ukrainians working in Poland due to just, you know, uh, cultural proximity and um, geographical proximity and um, simply, you know, it was a good place to work for them. And also our society is pretty open to uh, Ukrainian, um, you know, um, people working here and living here. So. Yeah, so we had them anyway, and uh, when the war broke out, it was like, you know, uh, during the first couple of weeks, there were like immense numbers, like there were weeks when there were 100,000 of people going through the border. And the recent estimates, because I also, you know, Sam, I checked today, the recent estimates are um, that there were like 10 million of refugees that went through the Ukraine and Polish border. Some of them went on to Europe. Um, 8 million actually did return uh, to Ukraine because like, you know, um, the most of the fighting is going on uh, in uh, the East. However, you know, there are bombings and, uh, and shellings all the time in the whole uh in the whole country so you know that key of Lviv, you're not safe anywhere uh so so yeah and um at the very beginning our people were like yeah f and even until now our pe at the very beginning everybody that i human you know everybody that i know is helping 
like people were it was really so heartwarming so amazing to see people just you know taking cars going to the border helping out the people taking them for free everywhere like you know businesses offered services for free like taxis hotels <clears throat> and of course in every shop there was and there is uh, a point of collection for food or clothes or uh, sanitary stuff for the refugees. And it is, you know, if I could, um, it is pretty amazing because I don't know actually anybody from my, you know, from the university, uh, any institution or anybody from my friends or even acquaintances who wouldn't have uh, for some time uh, a Ukrainian family at home. That um, is like, that's that's what I was going to say. I think that yeah. it's so striking. The, you, like you sit, look, we, you know, we see the worst of humanity and we see the best of yeah. humanity, right? And I yeah. think that, you know, we see what the, the really inhumane things that have happened in this in this conflict, as we see with all war. I mean, that's the nature of war. Sure. But we also see, we're just seeing the response to people that is really uplifting and heartwarming in, in this way. And I think that it's really good, you know, for my, for, for my students to hear that because sometimes, you know, we just, sure. we just focus on the negative and we don't focus on the positive. And, and I think that, hey, do you have any, do you have any question? You, so you, you were watching the stream, so you saw, um, Nestor here. Do you have any questions for him by chance? Or do you have a question for for Camilla? Did any or did did we talk about anything Camilla that you just thought like, "Hey, I'd like to hear more about that or I'm curious about it?" Uh yeah, you, if I may, uh concerning Nestor. Like, you know, I wonder oh man, how how do you feel? uh being like you know also in the middle i mean somewhere in between the worlds because this is where most of us are like you know in the middle earth what's that for you well whenever war started i was in high school and every day i during classes i turned on the stream and i just watched non-stop news for like a couple months after uh it basically consumed my life because I have family and friends there and I'm like worried, will, will my city get bombed, will, will my like, country get fully destroyed and like at the beginning of the war they said in just two weeks they will take over Ukraine and now we're a year later and Ukraine is still staying strong. And how, so tell the story though of you raising money for body armor for people. Camilla, this is an interesting story. Yeah. So, sure. so uh, it wasn't me particularly, but I did help out a little. It was mainly my sister and her, her uh, husband, her husband. So around Pittsburgh, she, uh, he had a friend that was a policeman, and he asked the policeman if he could ask all the police stations uh, if they are able to donate any body armor. So uh, they reached out to all the stations and a lot of them were willing to give out some body armor and uh, in like a couple of weeks they were able to collect over $10,000 worth of body armor. It was like three trucks filled of body, not trucks, like uh, uh, Jeeps filled with body armor and they sent it to New York where they sent it to Ukraine. Yeah, it's intense, man. I think it's intense just thinking. It's like Camilla with you, thinking every day with you. It's not just your husband. You know, you're connected to so many Ukrainians, right? Just like just like Nestor here, and and we have other students in class who have like gone through this with family members, and it's just it's just heart it's heartbreaking, really, to be thinking about it all the time. Yeah. It is. And, you know, some the thing is that, <laughs> oh, my God, um, apart from the fact that I have family there, my husband is there, and uh, 
I am also teaching about this conflict and I'm teaching, you know, I'm an anthropologist. Uh, so, uh, and I use your radical experiment in empathy a lot with my students. Uh, and recently, uh, it was actually, you know, and I'm teaching them about Russian strategic culture. I'm teaching them to understand uh, why Russia is behaving the way they are, why Russian people are behaving the way they are. And, you know, when we are doing the radical experiment in empathy, uh, it's like I had it with I had one Ukrainian student that did that. And it was like, you know, we understand them. We the most, you know, schizophrenic thing in being of uh, schizophrenic, or maybe a little bit in being an anthropologist and at the same time uh, engaged in that conflict emotionally, is that you do understand. And key, yeah. yeah. And you know, uh, and the sad thing is that understanding where they are they are coming from does not change the fact that the genocide that is going on in there, the atrocities, that it's unthinkable what is going on in there in the humanitarian dimension. But, you know, I was thinking about it today and uh, to me, uh, what you're doing there in that class, looking at the human dimension, first of all, uh, is amazing because... It is, I think, Svetlana Alexievich that wrote that when um, you are looking at the human dimension, at the chronicles of the soul at war, uh, you are touching the very great mystery of life itself. Yeah, I think that's really the... It's the mystery of life itself. Yeah. 